Hi, my name is Dr. Whitney Braun, and I am the host and one of the executive producers of Undiscovered, The Lost Lincoln on Discovery Channel. Hi, my name is Jason Cohen. I am the director and one of the executive producers of The Lost Lincoln on Discovery Channel. I am staring at a picture that just shouldn't exist. They took an illicit image of a dead president's body. I have to find out if it's real. The Lost Lincoln, Sunday, October 4th at 9, part of Undiscovered, the new series on Discovery. That is the trailer for the Discovery Channel documentary, The Lost Lincoln. And this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, a production company that makes documentaries about America for an international audience. Considered by many to be America's greatest leader and one of the most beloved presidents in history, there are only 130 known images of Abraham Lincoln on record. Credited with ending slavery and leading the nation out of one of its darkest periods, Lincoln's life and legacy were cut short that fateful night at Ford's Theater in 1865. Today, only limited items and a selection of known and verified photographs remain of the 16th president. But, is it possible another image exists? One that was taken of the president in secret after he was shot and has remained hidden for more than 150 years? We found out as we caught up with the filmmakers behind The Lost Lincoln, Whitney Brown and award-winning director Jason Cohen. Whitney Braun and Jason Cohen, welcome to Factual America. Whitney, how are things with you? They are excellent. I mean, as 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 well as can be, uh, considering the fact that we're quarantining in my uh, childhood bedroom. <laughs> exactly. I think we're all back under quarantine, and uh, I, I I am here in the in the UK. Uh, and Jason, uh, how about yourself? You know, about the same. I think we're all we're all adjusting and hoping hoping to get through this uh, sooner than later. But I'm glad, glad to be able to talk to you today. Well, I indeed, glad to have you on. Um, the film is The Lost Lincoln uh, from um, Mark Wahlberg's studio and Unrealistic Ideas. Discovery Channel uh, came out in early October. It kicks off the Undiscovered series on uh, the Discovery Channel. And I believe international release is set for December 20th for many of our listeners who are international. So, uh, uh, Whitney and Jason, thank you so much for coming on. It's uh, it's really great to have you here. Uh, the let's uh, just sort of cut to the chase. Uh, and Jason, I'll go to you as the director. Maybe uh, we've, I mean, we've had the uh, the cold open, the trailer. Uh, but uh, for those who are maybe distracted or making a cup of tea or something, uh, what is the what's the synopsis of this film? Uh, the Lost Lincoln is uh, an investigation to um, look at the uh, veracity of a uh, undiscovered photo, uh, allegedly, of Abraham Lincoln uh, on his deathbed. And, and the, the film, uh, through Whitney, uh, takes us on uh, an investigation um, to, to understand um, whether this photo um, is authentic. Uh, and, and Whitney, as a professional authenticator, is um, the perfect person to, to do that. Okay. I think, uh, indeed, and I think, uh, Whitney, so, uh, so first of all, auth uh, authenticator. I mean, from my, I'll, I'll channel my geeky self here. I think you've got the coolest job in the world. I told my 16-year-old daughter about it, and she agrees. You get oh, to, thank you. you. You get to research. I mean, you get paid to research and to authenticate whether historical items are are legitimate or not. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I guess it, it comes from um, uh, three sources. Uh, as a child, I, I grew up working in my, my dad's uh, gun shop and, uh, and people would bring in, you know, old, old firearms and say, hey, was this, you know, Davy Crockett's flintlock or was this, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, and so I loved watching Antiques Roadshow and I loved Forensic Files. So you kind of, you know, merge merge those things together and, and try to figure out if you can use processes of deductive reasoning to determine if something is authentic. And I mean, I think the thing to remember is you can never 100% say something is something, you okay. just can't prove that it can't exist, you know? And so you try to just basically build up a preponderance of evidence. Uh, excuse me, I just stumbled over that word. You just try to build up a preponderance of evidence, you know, and, and, and try to see if there is, um, anything that would make it impossible for it to exist. And, and that's just, it's, that's the thrill of it for me is, you know, trying to um, find out if there's anything that says it can't be. 
Do you do you have an area that you specialize in? Is there a period of American history or anything? Well, uh, not not a particular period of American history. I mean, like I, like I had mentioned, you know, I, I grew up uh, the daughter of a gunsmith, and my dad is featured in the documentary. Yeah. Um, and so um, I would say Western firearms, Civil War firearms. You know, that was mm. kind of where I cut my teeth. But it really doesn't matter the object, right? I mean, it's the right. same process of, of looking through old documents and trying to establish a chain of custody and, and doing, you know, running, running an object through a series of litmus tests. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's, I cut my teeth in American Western history, but, yeah. but I love to look into anything. And may I ask, I mean, because I've, I've seen the film. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in this role as an authenticator, I mean, how what's the success rate if you will i mean are you are you debunking things all the time and very low the yeah. the success rate is very very low because and i say this not to uh demean anyone who brings in an object that they think you know may have historic significance but it's very common for someone to go to a yard sale and find a picture of somebody wearing a cowboy hat and go hey I, you know I, i'm pretty sure this is um you know, this is a historically significant figure or, you know, find a picture of somebody wearing a top hat and immediately assume it's Lincoln. Right. Um, so I would say it's like less than 1% that actually pans out, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of um, uh, disappointment, frankly. So that's why when you do find something that, that uh, basically pass, when you do find something that passes muster, it's just cause for celebration and why making this film was just so exciting and and yeah. such an adventure well and then you know in that vein so so specifically what we're talking about uh, uh on this podcast what what happened a collector came to you basically saying they had this object and yeah. they wanted your you to auth do your job which is to authenticate it and what and what was your reaction when when you heard about <laughs> so it and saw it Sure. So uh, being completely frank, when I was for the, when I first heard about it, it was via phone call. So uh, I got a, uh, a call from a gentleman who says, hey, I've got a picture taken of Abraham Lincoln after he's dead. Um, but, you know, he's still in the Peterson house. And my initial reaction was, yeah, yeah, sure. And I almost I almost didn't follow yeah. up with it. I'll, I'll be frank. I almost didn't follow up on it because it just seemed uh, you know, a, a little too far fetched. And but, but I do kind of have a rule with myself that you just never know, right? The, the mm -hmm. strangest things are found in the in the most unexpected places. So, um, so I, I did return the phone call. And I did, I did talk with him. And he started mentioning things that the average person that might find an object at a yard sale and come to you uh, wouldn't know, you know, he said, well, you know, there, it was believed to have been taken by the Olkey brothers. And, and he started, he started laying out certain mm. little factoids that you kind of just go, wait a second, right. That it just piques your curiosity. And so I said, well, can I see it? Cause I can't do anything with just a verbal description. And so uh, when I saw it for the first time, um, I, I, th I think my, I, I, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I think my, my heart kind of skipped a beat because um, a, if you, whether you think this image is of Lincoln or not, right? So, 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 so the first point is whether you think it's Lincoln or not, it's a very startling image. It's a mm. very startling image. And it's very obviously a 19th century image of the dead. And th those are always kind of, you know, stark and startling. And then you start analyzing the features. And so immediately my gut said, there's something here, but the scientific mind goes, we can't make that leap yet, you know, yeah. and so yeah. thus the investigation, you know, commences. I think that's a good point here. You've gracefully uh, shared some clips with us, and there's one that uh, I think nicely sums up, now that we've gotten to this point, the, the authentication process that you go through in, in, with any object, whether it's a photo of Lincoln or not. So um, we're going to, we've put that in here. Uh, we'll have a, have a listen to that uh, or for those on YouTube, uh, watch it. And then, and then we'll, we'll come back. Abraham Lincoln, probably our greatest president, represents to me one making the ultimate sacrifice for their country. Abraham Lincoln was a great leader at the moment of the nation's greatest crisis. He'd ended slavery and he had won that horrible war. The idea that there might be a photograph of Abraham Lincoln after he was shot, in the world of authentication, that is like finding the Holy Grail. This image has the power to expose a tragic, 
dark and gruesome hour in American history. I have to find out if it's real. I'm going to conduct an authentication of the alleged Lincoln image. To prove if it is in fact Lincoln, I'll investigate three areas. Provenance. Provenance is a fancy way of saying chain of custody. Is there a clear chain of custody linking the night of the assassination to Larry Davis? Forensics. Can it be scientifically proven that the man in the alleged Lincoln image is the 16th president of the United States? Timeline. I will examine the timeline of the night Lincoln died to get a minute by minute account of April 14th, 1865. Was there a window of opportunity in which a photo could have been taken after Lincoln was shot? To find out, I'm going to the scene of the most infamous assassination in American history, Ford's Theater. Okay, I think that's, that's I thought that was really, uh, and it's the three strains of the, of the film, obviously, is this, uh, what you discuss is provenance, forensics, and timeline to, to try to determine whether an object, in this particular case, a previously unknown photo of uh, 16th U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, uh, whether it's, uh, well, whether it could possibly be a, 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 a real. Um, so one thing that came to my mind, uh, and, as, and Jason, we'll get you in here on, in a, a shortly, but uh, when did you, Whitney, when did, when did you know you had a doc on your hands? Because you've obviously, this takes some time and you had to be filmed doing this. Well, well, actually, um, just a little bit of backstory is we were looking at making um, a show that that was looking at items of potentially far less significance, yeah. um, you know, of other items that people had found. Um, and then the, the timing just happened to coincide with with this image crossing my path. And and so I, I spoke to our executive, one of our executive producers, Archie Gibbs, and, and I said, Archie, um, you know, we got to we got to see we got to see this picture, and um, and Archie kind of felt the same way that I did. You know, his heart skipped a beat, and and then we were just committed to telling this story. And and whatever the outcome was, we were still committed because it's such an interesting image yeah, yeah. that we went into it saying, hey, if whatever the outcome, it's going to be interesting regardless. And it's fun to take people on the journey of how do you authenticate or debunk something. And mm-hmm. then uh, and then we said, well, we need to you know. Uh, get this in the hands of someone who can really craft this as a little bit of like a true crime story, right? Of, of yeah. sifting through the yeah. evidence and, and, uh, and then Jason uh, was just the perfect person. And so, uh, so we formed a, a team and, uh, and it just, it, it just happened that way. I mean, it was, it was just truly uh, perfect timing on kind of all fronts that, that all of us were able to come together. And, and Jason, what did you think when you first got approached about this? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, the executive producers, Archie Gibbs and, and Paul Sadowski, who deserves yeah. a lot of credit, um, yeah. who, um, really drove a lot of this, um, the, the narrative and the story on this. Uh, they came to me. Um, and to be honest, the, the, my first meeting, I, I, I took the meeting. I was a little, I'll be honest, I was a little skeptical. It's not a type of uh, yeah. film I've really uh, done in, in this genre specifically. Yeah but I do like good stories and storytelling. Mm. And in my first meeting, I did get to see a, a digital copy of the image, um, signed the NDA and all that stuff. Yeah, anyway, exactly. Um, may talk but, about that later, but anyway. <laughs> uh, similarly similarly to, what, to what Whitney said, I was fascinated. I, I mean, I, honestly, I was, I was a bit hooked. I, I wanted to know more. Um, yeah. So what better way to know more than to go make a film about it? So, so I, I, I um, decided I, I wanted to be along that journey as we sort of peel back the, the, the layers and, and figure out um, where, the, you know, what is the story behind this image and ultimately trying to figure out if it's, if it's authentic. Yes, I, I think, I mean, I would, I completely agree having, having seen the film. I mean, you do take us on a, an incredible journey, which, uh, However you come out on, which either side you come out on this, uh, I think is is well worth taking. Um, and speaking of the journey, but the journey, you know, Whitney, I mean, and, and Jason, you know, you, you, so you have this, what, was this about two years, this search? You make it look easy. 
but was it really that easy? <laughs> you must have gone down a lot of rabbit holes, dead ends, uh, that we don't see necessarily on camera. Yeah, th this this was not easy, and um, I, and I think you know aged me quite a few years. So so there's there's two sides to this. There's there's the absolute stress of you know trying to find information that simply may have been destroyed over the last 150 years. So I have this this um, just sort of obsession with wanting to know the details and filling in the details, and it just kills me when there's just nothing to go to, right? There's no way to find information, there's nothing to know. And so this was quite difficult because this information was out there, but you had to go through a lot of old documentary evidence. You had to go talk to people and get, you know, just compile all this information. And it was, yeah, it was, it was definitely an uphill battle. Um, I mean, just, just as simple as, as it, it's, as simple as trying to, um, you know, find old, old letters that people wrote back and forth to each other mm -hmm. to verify conversations that people alleged that they had. So there was a lot that actually didn't make it in the documentary that was just part of piecing this whole, mm -hmm. uh, this whole story together to make sure that it held water. Yeah. And I mean, we'll maybe talk a little bit more about this and we're going to shortly take a, a bit of an early break, but uh, um, I mean, I, I mean, everyone you have on camera at some some raise some doubts, things like that. Uh, but did you have anybody that was uh, just, nah, no, nah, it's absolutely, I, I don't see how this could be. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we had a mix. I mean, I, I think we had people yeah. who, even if they were skeptical, they still could see something in there that yeah. might push you one way or the other. Uh, right. and, and, and they at least understood why this possibly held some water and and it could be authenticated even if they strongly inside felt like it wasn't it's not yeah. you know. um you know and and i think that was part of this process and and sort of a little bit back to what you were what whitney was talking about of sort of you know we got curveballs along the way um and, and this was an active investigation and that was for for the filmmakers for us our goal was to be a fly in the wall of whitney yeah. uh, out documenting this and trying to do her work and, and and for us to follow along and and she and we would get thrown curveballs where somebody would um debunk something or confirm something and that forced us to go chase down a different lead or a different person uh go to a different venue um figure out uh another expert that could weigh in on something that we just learned in our trip to washington dc um so you know it, it it was sort of uh, a little bit all over the map, I guess, for lack of a better term, and our travel was all over the map. But, um, you know, there were people that sort of pushed us in different directions. And our job was to try to investigate those as fully as we could. Um, and obviously, you know, Whitney has done this before. So she she understood about, you know, the, the provenance and the forensics and the timeline and trying to investigate each of those and in each turn that it took based on the people that we were talking to. Yeah, was good. I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, something that's difficult when you're dealing with a figure like Abraham Lincoln, right? When you're showing yeah. people an image, is that the image that we're working with is believed where right, we wait, we we posit in the film um, that it is believed to be taken of it's an image taken of Abraham Lincoln following his death, but you know, he is his eyes are still open, and that's very characteristic of 19th century memorial photography. Right. But it is an image that to the 21st century eye is quite potentially quite macabre or off-putting. And also it's a person in death. So whether you um, are a, a, a fan of, of Lincoln, the president, the man, or not, you, you tend to see Lincoln as he's depicted in our memorials and on, you know, the $5 bill. And, and, and so you have a picture of, of Lincoln, you know, the, the rail splitter, Lincoln, Lincoln, the, you know, the, the, the strong, um, you know, uniter of the nation. But this is a picture of someone at their most, you know, fragile state. This is, this is a picture of somebody in death. And I think some of the people that we showed the image to, um, they wouldn't necessarily question all of the historical facts. They say, I just don't, I don't see it. That doesn't look like him. And, and what it, Reminds me of sometimes is when you're like in a funeral home and you see someone in the, in the casket, they don't look like you knew them in life. And I think this picture posed a particular challenge 
because most pictures that I have investigated, okay, all actually prior to this, all pictures that I have investigated have depicted a person in life. And you don't realize how much is captured in a person's eyes when they're alive and how much that changes when the life goes out of them. So I think that was a unique aspect of this investigation that I had never encountered before. I think you raised some very interesting points and have answered even a few questions I was going to ask uh, about this. And I think uh, let's hold those thoughts because I think you raised some very interesting points about 21st versus 19th century attitudes and things like that. Um, but in the meantime, let's, uh, if for our listeners' sakes, let's take a quick, uh, quick break, a little bit of an early break and a pause for a word from our sponsors. So hold tight, and we'll be back uh, shortly with Whitney and Jason. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Whitney Braun and Jason Cohen, the uh, both executive producers. Uh, Jason uh, was the uh, is the director, and uh, Whitney's the uh, the the host or presenter of The Lost Lincoln, uh, out on Discovery in the U.S. and in the rest of the world by end of December. Uh, before the break, we were talking about this this image, and I you know. If I may say personally, and as, a, as an American, I mean, I've been living in the UK for a while, but I am an American, a US citizen, born and raised. I found it difficult to, you, so we do see the image for everyone out there. You do see the image in the, in the doc. Um, I found it difficult. And I, I think you've already said it was partly because it's an image of a dead person um, with eyes open. Maybe that was part of it. Um, I mean, for me, I, I think, like you say, um, we have all these images of Abraham Lincoln, um, and to see see that was I, I, the first few times that you put it on screen. I must say, I found it difficult to to look at and to watch, mm. um, for whatever reason, whatever my sort of hangups are. Although I, you answered question one of my questions I had because I did think about this, um, you know if you go to a funeral home and see, a, see how someone looks in death versus how they looked in life, um, which I think raises an interesting point because you do, um, uh, Whitney, you're, I, I know you, you have a, your day job is a, is a professor, isn't it? Uh, yeah, what I'm are a your professor. Day oh, I'm sorry, I just talked over you. Um, so yeah, my, my day job is I'm uh, the director of the master's program in bioethics. I'm a clinical bioethicist. But you also know some things about death rituals and, and this sort of thing. Is that right? Yeah. So I did my doctoral, excuse me, uh, I did my doctoral dissertation work on uh, the Jain ritual of Salekana, yeah. which is a, a voluntary fasting uh, okay. where the, the practitioner decides to give up all worldly possessions and slowly wean themselves mm. off of consuming other life forms, which results in a very gradual, slow starvation. Uh, and so, yeah, from my time in India and my time working in a hospital, and I, I started out my career as a paramedic, uh, I'm not unfamiliar with the deceased. And so I think when I first saw this picture, I was able to look at it and see what, what mattered, which was, you know, the facial features, the elements of a person that don't change. Because I do know, I mean, we always say this to med students, right? you just can tell when the patient's dead. You don't have to take the pulse. Mm. There's something that happens when a person dies and the light goes out of their eyes, the face changes. And, um, and so when I saw that picture, I immediately went, oh my gosh, this, I see the, you know, the facial features of Lincoln minus the essence of the man. And, and, mm. and I've seen that with many other people over the years. And so I think maybe my first time seeing it might have been a reaction that was different than another person seeing it for the first time. Okay. Um, I think that's something, well, while, since we're talking about it, what, I mean, it, 
Because in your research, you were noting, uh, I liked this comment you, you, you captured in the film, Jason, as well, about uh, you're at the National Archives. And I used to live in Washington, D.C., and I've done research at the National Archives and the Library of Congress, but you've got access that uh, people like me would have dreamed of had. Um, but, uh, you know, not to let previous reporting lead you astray, I think was essence, essence, the essence of what you were talking about with the guy from the, um, the Marshall's uh, office, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, and what do you see? I mean, how have attitudes towards death between then and now changed? I mean, I think that's part of a, 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 a sort of a side story to this, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think the differences between how we view death today and the way death was viewed in, um, in 1865 America, I mean, can't be overstated. I mean, uh, you know, I can wax poetic here about things such as, like we call a living room in our house a living room because once upon a time when people died at home, yeah. right, you, you displayed the body in the casket in the front window of the house. So, right. so you know, I, I, um, I'm thinking of other examples of today, like over 98% of Americans die in the hospital, but 75 years ago, most Americans, and I think this is true for most of the world, uh, most people died in their bed at their home. And so people lived with death. And like, yeah. as much as we are reeling and hurting from all the people that we have lost because of COVID, um, I think it's more traumatic for us today because we're so unaccustomed to living with death. When in 1865, when this photo was taken, infectious disease was the number one killer. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I, I could go on for days and I, you know, I'm sure Jason uh, can speak to this as well. I mean, Jason's, Jason's wife is a physician and Jason knows well, you know, how people, people have come to regard death as a very foreign entity, as opposed to something that lives alongside them day by day. It's interesting. Yeah, and I, go ahead, Jason. Well, yeah, no, I was just going to add, I, I think beyond how we view death then and now, the, the one thing that was always coming to the surface on this, and I think you hit on it a little bit there, that, that scene at the National Archives, is that we were dealing with arguably the most revered president in U.S. Yeah. history yeah. and one of the most revered people in U.S. history. And that instantly is going to bring more scrutiny. Um, and we knew that. Um, so no matter what we said, and when you put a picture uh, of, of that, uh, who's that reverential out there in this... Um, you know, compromised state, yeah. it's going to bring um, strong opinions. Um, so beyond what you think of how people think of death then and now, add to that who we're putting out there and telling you that this person who you've grown up as, as, as school kids knowing, Honest Abe and, and, and what he stands for, now we're telling you, look at this, you know, un unfortunately macabre picture of him. Okay. Maybe... Uh, um and I, I have no problems talking about death, but maybe let's bring this back to the, uh, and I'll take the responsibility for going down a, a bit of a tangent here, but uh, um, you, uh, one thing that you do show, because um, I've mentioned this to a few people in passing, um, they're like, oh, well, in the old days, how would they have, you know, how would they have done this? But you, you do, Whitney, you show that this, that certainly the timeline is possible, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the, the timeline is is absolutely possible, which I we didn't go into the documentary and the research thinking that necessarily, right? I mean, that, that was really a question we needed answered. And the only way we could answer that was to get um, Mark Osterman and Franz Osterman, who are, are you know undeniably the leading experts in collodion photography in the world, yeah. to essentially replicate the process. And um, you know, they they explained um that the camera is actually quite small and light. If you pre prep the plate and, and um, you know, Washington DC was quite humid in April. So the, the collodion mixture on the glass plate would, would stay uh, in the appropriate, you know, um, uh, solution on the glass plate, uh, pop it in, take the lens cap off. You get the exposure from the natural light coming in through the window. You could do that. And given the proximity of the Olkies to the scene of, you know, where the photo was taken. And also the, simply the fact that we know they took other pictures, right? We don't have to argue that fact. We know that they had a camera in the room. Um, you know, that's, that's what, um, you know, I think was initially gonna feel like the biggest challenge, but what turned out in the end to go, oh, it's actually a much simpler process than I realized. Mm. I think uh, just, so uh, for our listeners who may not know, not everyone on oh, this sure. call, you know, I'm just gonna say, um, 
No, I was just going to say, and having lived in Washington, and if you ever go visit Washington, I highly recommend going to Ford's Theater. Um, it's sometimes off the beaten track a, a bit for some tourists, but uh, but basically Lincoln shot at Lincoln's Ford's Theater, taken over to the Peterson House by pure coincidence, and one of those pure coincidences that we often see in history, the Olkey brothers board there, and uh, Henry becomes, or I don't know if he was yet known at that point, as, as a painter of presidents, isn't he? So uh, maybe, uh, and, and then we have a clip about the Olkey brothers, but maybe give us a little background on how this could have even been possible. Sure. So, um, so the Olkey brothers were two very prominent photographers slash journalists slash scientists actually living in the D.C. area in the 1860s. Uh, they actually worked at the Smithsonian. They were quite famous for pioneering uh, microscopic photographic techniques of beetles. Uh, so they were really, really, truly kind of in the vanguard, right, of, of, of early photographers. And they coincidentally were renting a room that was directly above the room in the Peterson house where Lincoln was brought. And because of their physical presence in the room or in the building, they got in essence conscripted into service as almost like orderlies to spend the entire night, you know, running back and forth, bringing linens, boiling water. So they had full access. Um, and then the next morning, uh, we were able to determine this through, um, again, contemporary documentary evidence. We know, for example, Henry Olkey is seen leaving the Peterson house about seven that morning. We know he comes back because he takes the known photos, right? The, the, the known photos of the empty bed. Where did he go? I often wonder, I think maybe he went to get a camera. I don't know that for sure, but we know a camera ends up in the room. Um, we know that they had access to the room through a back stairwell. Um, and, and we know that they were adept, and we show this in the documentary, at making ambrotypes which is the yeah. specific type of glass plate image uh, that we're dealing with in this story. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's listen to that clip now, and we'll be back very shortly with uh, Whitney and Jason. So we know quite a few things, actually, about the Olkey brothers. We know that they took a photo of the empty room after Lincoln had passed and everyone had cleared out. We also know that they lived directly upstairs. Yes. So as the timeline goes, the president's body is removed at approximately what time? That would be at about 9.30. When approximately did the Olkies take their photographs? Well, the deathbed photo would have had to be taken sometime after 9.30. And that picture isn't seen by the public until the 1960s, almost 100 years later? Yes. Henry, in 1891, told the newspapers that he was never a photo taken inside Peterson House. Why would Henry Olkey have denied that there were any photos taken inside of the Peterson House when we know for a fact that they at least took two of the empty bed in that room? Is it possible that they took another image of the dead president between 7.22 and 9.30 on the morning of April 15th, 1865? Okay, I think that gets, you know, gets to the, the timeline question. Now, we're not going to go hash this out. This is a, a, a documentary that everyone I, I highly recommend. Um, I think you've, you know, I, my credit to you, I think you've set it up very well. Like you say, it's capturing a journey, but I think uh, you certainly lay out the arguments very well. And so I don't, I don't think we need to, if you don't mind, I don't think we need to necessarily rehash those here. Um, I just, just recommend listeners go, go watch it. Um, but, uh, Whitney, are you, I mean, uh, not to give anything away, no spoiler alerts, but are you in a position to say, you know, at least on this podcast, are you able to say what your, your conclusions are? Are you, do you believe? Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. So, so this is the, the conclusion that I have arrived at. Scientifically speaking, there is no piece of evidence that we came across that made it impossible for this picture to exist, right? There was, there was nothing that contradicted that there was a window of opportunity for the photo to be taken, qualified people there to take the photo, and then a provenance or chain of custody that made sense. Um, 
then if we throw in the, the physical evidence, the forensics, you know, the glass plate matches an 18, mid 1860s vintage, the facial mapping on the face matches known um, anomalies in the skin of Abraham Lincoln. For me, there's nothing to say it can't be. Yeah. So at that point, given the preponderance of evidence, I have to, you know, basically rely on Occam's razor here, right? That all things considered, the simplest explanation is the most likely, which you have a photo of a man that is either Abraham Lincoln or his identical twin, but if he's his identical twin, which we have no record of, he's also been shot and suffered a head wound that is consistent with the autopsy report of Abraham Lincoln. And that there would be, in my opinion, statistically too many coincidences for this to be anyone other than Abraham Lincoln. So at the end of the day, I arrive at the belief that it is Abraham Lincoln. That being said, the world is full of surprises and possibilities. And, you know, you can never say anything is 100% certain, right? I, I can't prove the existence of God. I just yeah. can't prove that God doesn't exist. Um, so I'll just borrow from Kant there, but like, yeah. you know, but that's, but that's essentially what this is, right? We can never 1 billion percent prove that this is Lincoln, but we can't prove that it's not. And with yeah. all the factors that we have on the table to consider, what plausible scenario is there that, that it's not? So that's kind of where I stand on it. Okay. Jason, are you of, of a similar view? I mean, I, I feel like, um, our goal with the film is to present all this evidence that we came yeah. across, yeah. put it out there, uh, and let the audience make their own informed decision based on watching Whitney uh, do this investigation, hear from all the experts we talked to, look at all the evidence that's been uh, put together. Um, I, I, like Whitney, agree that we can't ever say without certainty whether it is or isn't, but I, but I, I think that our goal is to put it all out there to have you have the viewer make as an informed decision as they can about whether, and some people will never believe it and some people will. I mean, I, that's, and that's, that's the society we live in. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah, well, it will indeed. And I think, I mean, just maybe a final point on that is uh, uh, maybe something we can talk about later about uh, people gaining access eventually to this, the, the actual, um, um, Ambro type photo um, on a glass plate, but are there is there now moves afoot by scholars to maybe look at you know based on what the work you you all have done at trying to maybe you know there's always going to be skeptics like you said I, I won't even share what my view is given what you've just said because I think that's the perfect way of leaving it um, but it, you know is it, are there moves afoot I mean you had some scholars come on some leading scholars Lincoln scholars so are there are there, is there, or I guess you must have people beating down your door or whoever has the image um, uh, wanting to, to get their, get a hands on this. Well, I can say this, that, I mean, since the documentary aired in the U.S., um, yeah. I think I actually, my email mailbox uh, at the university got over a thousand emails in one week and actually clogged up my, my inbox. My students weren't real thrilled about that um, with people asking questions and um, posing their objections. I mean, but this is what I will say about it. It was completely civil. And I have to say that in our society, I was expecting an onslaught of like name calling and who do you think you are and how dare you? And none of that. I got, I got really gracious emails from people saying, you know, I don't agree with you because the nose doesn't look right to me. Or, you know, I don't agree to you because I don't agree with you because I just don't think that they would have taken a picture of the president. I just don't think they would have. It would have been shameful, you know, but, but no one has been rude. Um, everybody's been incredibly gracious. And I, I I'll, I'll say this, that I feel like people had fun watching the show and are still having fun in the treasure hunt of trying to find other evidence. Cause I'm getting people who sent me like newspaper clippings saying, Hey, there was a person allegedly showing a picture of dead Abraham Lincoln in this newspaper clipping from 1954, but I don't know if it's the same picture. Do you think it could be the same picture? Mm. So yeah, I mean, there, there's a bunch of, um, I would say amateur investigators looking at it. I have no idea about the scholarly community. I only know who's reached out to me via email and it, and there's a ton of citizen investigators out there who seemingly are having a great time looking into this. Well, 
I think you've restored my faith in my in a fellow man, uh, actually, and it's great to hear, uh, especially at times like these. That uh, and maybe it's being removed by 150 years, though that that hasn't necessarily proved the case in, on other issues. Um, uh, Jason, I mean, you, I think you've already said how you got involved. You got approached about making this um, as a filmmaker, and I think you, we've talked a little bit about. Uh, you gave, uh, I guess, Paul Sadowski quite. Uh, you know, a, a shout out. But uh, how did you tell to decide to tell this story structure? I mean, presenter led versus narration. Uh, you put Whitney in front of the camera. Um, how'd you go about that? Yeah, well, I, I think from the outset, um, we knew we we didn't want to use a narrator. Uh, th yeah. This this story is ultimately it's it's a bit of Whitney's personal journey. Um, you know, so we, we wanted it to be her voice and I, and I myself never refer to Whitney as a host or a presenter. Okay. Um, to me, she's a, um, she's an investigator on her journey. She's, she's our, she's our guide. Uh, she's guiding the audience along. Uh, but I, I don't like to refer to her in the traditional sense of a host who, who, who's there to tell the audience what to think. Rather, we are there watching her do her work and then you take from it what you will instead of her telling you what you know exactly um, how to look at something or how to how to go forward with something. Um, so yeah, the, the the intention was always that this is a personal journey, um, and we are along for the ride. Uh, and that was you know the whole team, uh, Paul and and Archie uh, Gibbs are their executive producers. You know from the get go, we we were intent on that and um, wanted it to feel that way, uh, where you're sort of brought into it and you're you're along along for the ride with her and an active part of it, as opposed to just being told what's going on, um, you know, and, and, and that's why we wanted to be there when she meets with these people the first time, the first time she walks into the Ford's Theater, the, or, you know, that reaction of, you know, you talked yeah. about it, I got it, walking into the National Archives and um, that, that raw emotion of, of actually going to these places. And it, it is, you do feel it when you're there. I felt it when I was there. It was, um, you know, one of the cool, <laughs> cool aspects of this film was being able to go to these iconic places and really understanding what it was all about. Yeah, and and uh, you would agree. I th I thought Whitney's a natural in front of the camera. I totally think? agree. Yeah, yeah. She, she was great. I mean, I, when I told people she had never really done this before, they were they were surprised. <laughs> so Whitney did a great job. She she got so used to us, you know, kind of hanging around. We usually had two two or three cameras uh, following her wherever she went. And, um, you know, she, she really was a pro and, and, and fell into it and got, and, you know, got used to it. So. And not to put words in your mouth, but wouldn't you say, um, I mean, as a documentarian, that if you're following someone who's truly passionate and knowledgeable about their subject, they're going to be most likely will be good in front of the camera. Yeah. And, and hey, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, I made it look like I was about to uh, jump over you. No, no, no. Yeah. And listen, Whitney's been doing this for a long time. She knows what he's yeah. She knows what she's doing. And that's completely evident uh, on camera when you see her asking the right questions and, and how to approach things and how to, you know, critically think about uh, things most importantly in a, in a job like this um, and, and in not being swayed so easily one way or the other and being able to look at the, the whole big picture and, and question everything. And, and, and she, she does that. And, and I learned a lot about her job and what she does and how you have to approach it and, and do it. Yeah, I, think, I think it's a very fascinating job. But that, again, that may be my own personal uh, sort of background. But Whitney, um, this must have been fun. You got your dad starring on this. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad played a huge role in the investigation that just doesn't always get captured on camera because we don't, you know, we don't have me on the phone with him constantly uh, in, in the documentary. But, you know, I mean, um, my dad's who taught me how to do this, you know, and so um, uh, one of the one of the uh, experiments that we did was uh, you see in the documentaries, we did a ballistics test. So uh, we, we were able to, um, you know, get a replica of the same type of Derringer that was uh, used in the assassination. And, um, and that was like, you know, it was like, I felt like a kid again, you know, to a certain extent, because it's like, you know, getting, getting to play, you know, we were getting, we were getting to play and we we're getting to do this together. And, and, and I, I can't give my dad enough credit for, for helping in this process with a lot of the research. 
Yeah, I think uh, for those of you, even for you who've made it this far in the podcast and are still not interested necessarily in uh, knowing whether this is a photo or not of uh, Abraham Lincoln, it's well worth watching just for the scene where you're doing the ballistics test, I would say. I thought that was a, I was wondering where are they going with this? Um, but uh, it, it was a lot of fun, and I see that bomber jacket in front of behind you. There oh, was, yeah, I, I, <laughs> <It's my> jacket. <laughs> I, I love the comment, bomber jacket. You, Dad, you didn't get the bomber jacket memo, or you did get the bomber jacket memo. But so if, I really question free will, uh, whether free will exists or not, because my dad and I, um, you know, over the years have periodically shown up at events where we have not discussed in advance what we are going to be wearing, and we're wearing exactly the same outfit. Now, I'm wearing the feminine version, he's wearing the masculine version, but... Yeah. Um, it makes me just question whether or not I actually have any free will uh, because we somehow make parallel decisions. Hey, I think that's a whole nother podcast. I mean, you're the first guest to quote Kant, but uh, oh. <laughs> we'll, uh, but uh, right. there, there you go. I was just going to comment one thing about just in general, this idea of, you know, you mentioned that, you know, how are we going to fit this in? But that was, you know, a big intention going in, you know, with the film was like figuring out using modern technology to help us things that were not available then yeah. to help us try to decipher exactly what happened what this image is and 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 you know being able to do ballistic tests and facial recognition technology um and things that we had at our disposal um were, were a big part of this and we knew that going in and that was a big part of the plan from the beginning um and so yeah, and it's funny when you say it because I I got the same reaction when I told somebody we were going to film at a, a shooting range, and you know, sort of how does that help in telling an archival, you know, an archival narrative? Um, but it was it was helpful, I think, and it, I think it does give the viewer something to kind of be able to connect with and, and um, you know put their hands on a little bit more and understand a little bit more um, what we're looking at. Yeah, I think, and that's one thing that you, I mean. As a filmmaker, I mean, this maybe this is one of the elements. Uh, how do you go about bringing a 150-year-old mystery to life, especially one that doesn't benefit from archival film or footage, yeah. you know? Yeah, well, I, I think part of what drew me in, you know, um, was this idea of, like, being able to shoot it as an active investigation as opposed to just talking head archival retelling of an event, um, you know? without Whitney driving the narrative and having her to follow uh, to all these different places. And we do obviously get into, we need to tell what happened and a little bit of that in the archival and footage, archival uh, photography and, and the, the, you know, the, the talking heads from historians, which are all part of this. Um, you know, having this active element was such a huge part of this uh, where you can, you know, really kind of dive in and sink your teeth into it as it's happening and unfolding before your eyes. And for me, that was a big draw of the project to begin with. And, and you know, um, Archie and Paul, our executive producers, had already done a lot of the legwork in figuring out, you know, who, who we can talk to and who we can go out and follow and go into Illinois and D.C. and New York and California to kind of find all these different aspects of the story. Yeah, you must have had a hell of a travel budget. But uh, I think... Uh, um, you know, I think uh, I think that's a very good point for those listeners. It's not, uh, and nothing against Ken Burns, but it's not Ken Burns' Civil War. I mean, it's it's yeah. as you as you described it. It's a very much a uh, well. You've, we've we've touched on it a few times. It's kind of a, a bit of a true crime. It's a journey. It's it's following Whitney on this journey in dis of discovery, which is uh, um, very uh, compelling and and entertaining. Um, now it strikes me, I. I having you here, I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask some questions about how this film almost didn't see the light of day. Um, and um, I'm not sure, I don't want to go into some, too many details there, but I mean, um, what do you want to, you know, maybe take this opportunity to say some things about uh, others who are saying that this film should not have been allowed to be shown? I mean, I don't, I don't know that there's anything that we, we can legally say, you know, at this point, um, other than that, you know, the injunction was, was tossed out. I mean, yeah. you know, um, and, and again, the ownership of the image is a completely different matter than the authenticity, right? I mean, the Mona Lisa is the Mona Lisa, regardless of whether it's at the Louvre or in the Smithsonian, who owns it's irrelevant. Um, and so that's, that was the attitude that we took is that whoever ends up owning this at the end of the day, that's 
what they choose to do with it, that's that's completely on them. I mean, nor neither, excuse me, neither Jason nor myself have any ownership in the image. We don't, we won't ever see any ownership in the image. Yeah. So we just said we, we're we're just going to tell the story of its authenticity or lack thereof, depending on which way it went, right? We didn't know necessarily going in what the result of this was going to be. And so we are going to tell that story and the ownership is for the courts to decide and for it to be um you know, handled in a completely different forum than what we're focusing on. Okay. So have you actually, because what we see in the, in the film is a, is a, a digital copy of, yeah. of the actual, have you actually seen the original Ambro type? I have. Um, so the, the image that we're using in the documentary, uh, so, so the, the image passed through, through many owners and yeah. the, the image that we're looking at uh, we're exploring it with Larry Davis. And now Larry Davis is the gentleman that is the linchpin here between Margaret Hanks, who is the, you know, relative of Abraham Lincoln, who had it in a steamer trunk in her house. You know, Larry, Larry Davis is, is the link to our present. And so we, we talked to him and really that's all that mattered for our purposes because who legally owns it today is again, not relevant to the authenticity of the image. Larry Davis is the one that took it in hand from Margaret Hanks and the details she shared with him are what, were what we needed to know whether the image was real or not. And she, I mean, Margaret Hanks to me is this perfect example of how history goes undiscovered, right? Here's a woman who's a relative of Lincoln living this life of obscurity in a house that was ultimately condemned. I mean, she was, her house was considered a hoarder's house. Um, at the, wow. you know, when she passed away and she had a steamer trunk full of all of these amazing photos that we don't get into in the documentary, but there was a whole collection of photos. It's just the one of Lincoln is the most outstanding, um, of, of the Hanks and, and, you know, and the Lincoln families. And, and what kills me is if, if Larry Davis hadn't gotten that image from her, that would have all just gone in a dumpster. <sighs> Yeah. Right, that would have all gone to the dumpster, and that happens so much. And so, I have a job doing this that I love largely because so much of history literally just gets dumped in the trash because people die, the story dies with them, and you know, a granddaughter comes in and wants to flip the house and sell it, so they call in a dumpster and a crew, and, and away that history goes. And that's that's to me the great tragedy of our time in many ways. Yeah, I think uh, although you're giving uh, you're giving rationale for hoarders everywhere now. No, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think my, my a bit of myself included. Um, no, but we. I mean, my wife and I find it too. I, no, we don't even know to go there. But some of the furniture you find it, that's just being given away, you can't. You, people just really don't even realize what they've what they've got on their hands. I mean, there's um, crazy examples of like a, a guy bought Ansel Adams original glass plates of his oh photographs goodness. of Yosemite at a garage sale in Fresno several years back. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, the examples are, are, are plentiful, but I think if I had one dream going into this, this process, and I, I said this a million times to Archie, uh, Archie Gibbs, our executive producer, it, I would just hope that whether you believe this is Lincoln or not, right, and you can completely poo-poo us and, 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 our, mm. and, and not agree with the, with the conclusions, but just if it just makes one person go into their attic and go, Hey, you know, I got some cool photos up there. I should probably take a second look at that before I put it in the dumpster, the spring cleaning session. If one person saves one piece of history, cause they watched our documentary, I'm going to call this a success. Okay. And then you've got a series on your hand, don't you? Uh, <laughs> uh, one, one thing I want to, cause I, I don't want to hark on this, but um, uh, so what we're alluding to dear listeners, there's um, you know, Google it, you can find things. Uh, but uh, basically there's a dispute around the ownership of the image and you've gotten caught up a little bit into this uh, and they try to put a temporary restraining order on the release of the film. Now, what is public records? They've put out press releases. And one thing that caught my eye, and I was just curious if you wanted to, they are claiming that the photo was taken before Lincoln died. Is that if is that correct? I mean, is that what they're? Is that your understanding? And well, and that is that's the assertion that 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 they are making, but that is not that is not our finding. Yeah. So um, so our our findings in terms of constructing a timeline that matched with the moment of opportunity to take the picture, the physical light available to capture the image, and who was who was physically present to take the image 
would put the image at roughly 9 a.m. on the morning of April 15th, 1865. So he was pronounced uh, at s about 7.20, 7.22. Yeah. And then his body was, was still in the Peterson house until between 9, 9.30, when uh, the quartermaster's corps, uh, led by George Valentine Rutherford, brought in a casket. Uh, they had to have a custom casket made for him because he was so tall. Yeah. Um, and so um, we, you know, kind of factoring all these things together, there was, a, there was a window of time, about an hour, where George Valentine Rutherford who, you know, who in our chain of custody is the one that brought it to Quincy and gave it to Margaret Hank's grandfather. He had a one hour window of time where he was in control of that room and where the Olkies were still cleaning up the room uh, from the previous night's activities and where we know a camera was in the room because they took those other images. So, so no, we don't, we don't believe that it was taken the night before. We believe it was taken uh, roughly uh, between, let's just say between 8.30 and and nine thirty the next day. Okay, and uh, something that was uh, kind of it, it's in the um, um, it's in the film. And one last thing on this is um, you go to Rochester, New York, the uh, home of uh, Eastman Kodak, uh, or however it still exists these days. Uh, and I think that's where your expert on ambrotypes is. Is that uh, this uh, you talked to? But he said he'd seen the image before. Is that right? Yeah, so you know, it it might be a misnomer to say that this image was completely undiscovered because um, the image has existed and um, and has been seen by other people over the years, and that was actually part of the provenance is is going back to Quincy, Illinois, and going back to everybody who said, "Oh yeah, yeah," you know, I had dinner with Margaret Hanks in 1978, and she pulled it out, and then I, you know, so so yes, is it has it been publicly seen? Uh, prior to our documentary, no, um, but there, you know, there are stories going back 150 plus years of people who were like, oh yeah, I saw it, or oh, you know, hey, I, I uh, you know, I went, I, I talked to so-and-so who said they saw it. So that was part of the chase uh, early on with the image was, you know, if, if a picture just shows up and no one's ever heard of it or seen it before, that's, that's actually very hard to authenticate. Mm -hmm. um, but when you can go back and there's an established trail, like including old newspaper clippings, you know, and people talking about it and the Quincy Historical Society saying, oh yeah, somebody brought it here. And, you know, when you can, when you can find all those little kernels, you know, uh, going back hundred years that don't necessarily make for great documentary filler, you know, <laughs> um, like dinner at Margaret Hanks house in the late seventies, isn't maybe going to fill an entire scene in a documentary. Um, you know, that there, there was a lot of that that just didn't make it to the final film of, of being, you know, of researching its existence over the past 150 years. Okay. Well, and, and as, as we all know, loads and loads of uh, footage ends up on the cutting room floor to, to make a, in order to make a, a, a feature doc. Um, I guess, um, it, so I guess what's pending is this ownership dispute and then we don't know how that will play out, but at some point there, I guess the hope would be that it it does go public in some form or fashion. Well, the the hope would be that whoever wins the ownership battle yeah. would be open to doing more testing, because okay. you know what if we could what if we could dust for fingerprints, you know, <laughs> what if we could um, mm -hmm. find trace amounts of DNA on it? What if we, you know, there's just there's just a laundry list of other tests that you could yeah. do if you could if you had the permission to physically um, access the image. But uh, but for now, it is being held by the courts, and so um, you know, just just wait and hope and pray that um, that someday that we can do more research. Okay, and you know, so both of you as as Americans. Um, if this is indeed the an image, a photo of uh, of the last, or the lost, I should say, the lost photo of Abraham Lincoln, um, the hundred thirty first of uh, image that we become aware of. What is, I mean, what? Uh, in each one of you, take a turn at this. What What do you think is the importance of this image? Do you want to go first, Jason? All right, no, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so. <sighs> People will say, well, it's going to change history. I don't, it doesn't change history. Lincoln is still, Lincoln, history is still played out the way it's played out. But what it means to me, and I cannot speak for what it means to the greater public, um, 
I think can kind of be summarized by the fact that early on when I had showed the image to people, a lot of people's reaction was, oh, oh, that's, that's macabre. Oh, that's disrespectful, you know, yeah. that, that image to show him in such a frail state. And I don't see it that way. I mean, I think if I felt that this was remotely disrespectful uh, or, or, or had malintent, I, I wouldn't want to have pursued this. But, but I don't feel that way at all. I mean, I, I feel like here is this great man who means so much to us and he was ultimately human. And, and you know, what do all humans experience? Well, we ultimately experience death. And I think that in a way, I mean, it's, it's a tribute to the fallibility of, of, of humanity, right? That we can fight, we can, we can do wonderful things, we can move mountains, we can unite nations, we can free slaves, but father time comes for all of us and sometimes sooner than later. And unfortunately in his case, from an assassin's bullet, because he stood for something. And now it makes me think of one of my favorite quotes and I'm, I'm not getting the words right exactly, but it's the sentiment is Winston Churchill said, you know, people don't like you good. That means you stood for something. And, um, and, and obviously Abraham Lincoln stood for something and that was ultimately what, what cost him his life is John Wilkes Booth very much uh, did not approve of, of the Emancipation Proclamation or, you know, reunifying the, the country and took Lincoln's life as a result. And so I don't see it as disrespectful. I see it as a memorial, right? A memorial image to someone who gave their life in service of their country. And that's just me. I mean, other people may view it differently, but I, I view it as um, a very poignant moment captured in time that makes you appreciate a sacrifice that another American made so we can have the life that we have. And what do you think, Jason? I mean, I, I think we hit on it a little bit in the film. And for me, it's, you know, there's 130 images of Lincoln and they're almost exclusively very staid portraits, um, very set up, you know. Uh, and as a filmmaker, you know, when I, when I show up with a camera, I'm not as interested in, if I show up to like a, a, a press conference, I'm not as interested in setting up in the middle with the shot directly looking at the person talking. I want to be around the side and seeing what's going on back there and, and sort of, you know, if there's some chaos or, or, mm -hmm. or getting real emotion. And I think that's what this, this picture actually shows some real emotion and, and, and vulnerability in somebody that people thought they knew, um, but probably only knew so much based on, on legend and, and, and photos we've seen. And I think just getting a little bit of that window into somebody, um, that they, and I think Whitney said in this, that, you know, th th they're a human being. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think giving some of that, um, a little bit more of that insight into, into seeing somebody in, in the state. And, and I agree, when I was first told about this, I kind of assumed, oh, a gory picture, a post post-mortem picture. It's not that at all. Um, it, it is a little eerie. Um, but it, it is not a gore and it's not sensational uh, in, in that way. And I, I do think it does, um, give you a little bit, it pulls back the curtain a little bit on, yeah. on somebody, a figure that we've all known for, for years. Okay, I would. I would you know what I, I, oh, I'm so sorry. See, what I kind of liken it to is a lot of times, you know, in our culture that reveres strength as, a, as an essential part of masculinity, um, when, when a man starts to decline, he retires from public life so that people only remember him in his most robust form. And I've always felt I don't care for that idea. I don't think that there's anything um, disrespectful or shameful about the natural progression of life and death. And in whatever form you exist in, you know, whether it be at your full strength or in a state of disability, that is who you are and it does not diminish you as a person. And so that's how I feel about this photo. It does not in any way diminish the greatness of Lincoln. Okay. And I said that was going to be maybe the last thing, but one, one thing that did, it's toward the end of the film, if, I, if you don't mind me raising this, I found remarkable. I had never heard this before. Um, you uh, you talked to someone about the autopsy, and it, he says that the wound did not have to be mortal. Is that is that correct? Uh, yeah. So I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I actually got quite a few comments on that myself from from people. Um, you know, yeah. I, I work in the medical community, and and um, there's actually a theory, right, that one of the reasons in movies 
that they always show like in the old Western when they pull a bullet out of somebody and they drop it in a pan and you hear that clink sound mm -hmm. that that actually is inspired by the autopsy description of when they lifted Lincoln's brain, the bullet fell out in a pan and made an echoing sound. And um, the belief at the time was that if you could basically dislodge the bullet and get it out, that would allow the tissue to heal. Today, we wouldn't do that, right? And so then in their attempts to dislodge the bullet, they were essentially damaging the white matter in the brain. Um, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, it may, it may, according to Amalo, it may not have been fatal if it had been just left alone, but, um, you know, the, the attempts to do the right thing may have actually ultimately caused his demise. Okay. And, and I think I won't go into too much more detail, but you do say, I mean, you talked to someone who's a, a expert on uh, Lincoln's health. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like he wasn't long for this world mm -hmm. anyway, not that it's great that he left this world the way he did, but uh, no, but I thought that was very interesting because it's not something that that is, I mean, you bring a lot of new things um, to the historical record, I'd say, or even bring things out that maybe people had forgot, uh, had kind of lost track of. But uh, it was was an interesting point. Um, I think uh, I'm, I hate to say, it, but I think we're coming to the end of our time together. Um, and so, uh, uh, well, Jason, let me start with you. Uh, what's next for you? What projects do you have um, after this? Uh, you know, I think everyone's in a little bit of a. Uh, you know, holding pattern. Unfortunately. Exactly. Um, I, I've spent the last few months actually uh, developing a lot of ideas that had kind of been sitting on the shelf for a bit because uh, I did have a few projects that were getting ready to go and they kind of got, um, you know, delayed, <laughs> let's say, yeah. for a bit. We're hoping, hoping to, to, to get back, but it, but it has given me time to kind of revisit some projects I had been developing um, and getting some writing done. Uh, yeah. And we're hoping, you know, you know, we're hoping things, you know, get to the point where we can get back out and, and really start filming as we would, we would like to do um, on projects uh, in a safe, in a safe manner. So, okay. Um, yeah. Hey, well, best of luck with that. I have, I have must say, I'd kind of forgot, I, I, not that I've forgotten about COVID, but I've kind of stopped asking the COVID question. But yes, it is, it's, it's more than the elephant in the room, obviously. Uh, but Whitney, what about for you besides uh, being a, professor of bioethics and a authenticator what's what's next for you well besides those two things i mean it's it's sort of a it's a busy time because i teach i teach public health ethics right so yeah. this is this is kind of my my busiest time in my career um but people are not antiquing right now it's not a surprise right people aren't going yeah. to swap meets and fairs so that area for me has has dried up just a little yeah. bit and actually though um i'm actually working with a law firm doing investigations into some old legal cases because it's, it's the same process, right? So, um, so I'm actually doing legal investigation right now. Are you um, doing, for, are, you, are you doing cold cases? Yeah, I am actually um, working for, uh, for a law firm uh, working on that. And I mean, I, I love it, right? I mean, whether you're doing contact tracing, I mean, cause that, that's how I got into healthcare actually in large parts. I, I did my master's in public health because I like doing contact tracing and working your way back to patient zero. It's, mm. I mean, investigation is, is the same, you know, whatever the field. And so um, I just, I just enjoy doing that. So now I'm, I'm working with a, a law firm doing some, some cold cases. And then my fiance has been stuck in a hotel room in Peru since March 16th because of the court, the, the quarantine. So I'm going to be able to go see him finally on December 15th. And then we will, start our life so that's that's what's next for me is this finally re, uh having a reunion with jorge oh congratulations Thanks. yes i am um, i am i know i too know some people not peruvians but p people who were stuck in peru for a while there's a because they were one of the first ones to lock down yeah that's yeah. uh wow well this is uh one hell of a year for you isn't it um but uh, best of luck with that and congratulations. And I'm glad you're going get, to get to meet up with Jorge. Hello, Jorge. If you, do, <laughs> if you watch this, we're giving you a shout out. Um, well, let me, let me wrap up there. I want to thank both, uh, both of you, uh, Whitney Braun, Jason Cohen. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's been very much appreciated. Um, for those of you, just to remind you, remind you we're talking about the Lost Lincoln out on Discovery in the US and possibly other places, but definitely out internationally on December 20th. Um, also want to give a shout out here to This Is Distorted Studios here in Leeds, 
England. Please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. And this is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.